October the 26th, 1917, the coming of dawn, a most desolate scene. The entire expanse of the countryside in all directions is one broken waste, unspeakably dreary and barren. Shell hole merged in shell hole as water and impossible at any point do Germans shell this area almost insistently, and our artillery does so like measure. Nine months in France and Belgium completed. Douglas Macpherson. Three years of stalemate on the Western Front. Three years of blood, mud and rain. Three years of tunneling under the Germans to blow them up with TNT. The tunneled explosives were set off at Bassine Ridge, creating the largest explosion in human history pre-nuclear. Thousands were instantly killed, some buried alive, some burnt alive, and others limped away with limbs missing. The infamous Sir Douglas Haig was going to break through in Flanders and win this war. He was wrong, and over the course of five months, a quarter of a million allies, mostly British, Canadian, South Africans, Australians, New Zealanders, Indian Raj, Newfoundlanders, Scots, and other Dominions would be killed and wounded at Passchendaele. Even though the battle began on the 31st of July 1917, the main meat of this story actually comes from two months later in October. A runner arrives to the Canadian General Headquarters. His orders, his Canadian men were to take over the steel defensive at Flanders, Passchendaele. Let them have it, the mud is not worth a single drop of blood, especially Canadian blood, Sir Arthur Curry said. Sir Arthur Curry himself was an unlikely hero, a real estate speculator in Vancouver before the war. But his leadership and care for his men were key in capturing Vimy Ridge. But Passchendaele was thus far not going well in Curry's eyes. However, he could not disobey Sir Douglas Haig's orders. Haig himself was in trouble of being relieved of command. With the Somme and two years of no reclaimed ground, Passchendaele was his last saving grace. Passchendaele itself had been a British stronghold since 1914 and the race to the sea had ended. Now Haig was sure that Passchendaele would be his breakthrough point, the one he wanted and desperately needed. But the Germans held the high ground of the ridge. Sir Lloyd George and the British public were growing weary of the war. Three years and three million British and Empire troops dead. How many more? The pre-bombardment, the artillery was so intense that the German messenger commented, Am Grassenmatch Junja Weizum Funkamp. Unsher Wig war in Kreta Landslatch. Weerfums an Unsten Bantin Fazazun an Usten Gafin Weber. Zerigen an Artillery Fusiena Fortsla Wonsta Unth Dai Tonten. Unt Wagoslatch Sin Un Faden Run Salassen. In single fire, we advanced to the ridge of fire. Our path was a crater of torn landscape. We passed burnt out vehicles and equipment. The rain of artillery continues to fire to pour down on the dead, refusing them to rest in peace. Karl Women Waffe. In response to the unrelenting artillery, the Germans released chlorine gas and they used their new deadly weapon, mustard gas. It was a heavy gas that burnt the eyes and irritated the flesh and even after the fumes were supposedly gone, the ground was waiting for its next victim. Despite this, they went over the top on the 31st of July 1917. Beginning their way over the fields, then rain began to fall. Combined with the flooding of the pipes in Flanders fields, turned the ground into a muddy quagmire. On the battlefield, it was a double horror of being cut down by German MGs and artillery, or being so tired that you would fall into the mud and slowly drown to death. In just a month, there were over 100,000 casualties and the battle was still going. So next, he sent the Anzacs to take over from the British. They did a bit better gaining a little bit more ground, but in the face of German MGs and riflemen defending, they lost over 60% of their men. Haig was worried. Haig was worried. Passchendaele was his biggest boast, and if he didn't deliver soon, he could lose his command. That's when the order for Bing's army came, and that's where the story starts. Curry refused, and Haig actually came to see him personally at Canadian HQ. He told Curry it was necessary to do this to push forward and take these objectives. We know in the back of his mind, we're doing it for selfish goals of Haig. But Curry had the upper hand, and he actually had the attack down to the date and time, and he was in control of the attack. It was to be on October 1917, they began to slowly march into hell. They marched into Belgium where they saw crosses piled up alongside the road, for the graves soon to come. The mud of Passchendaele. It was more or less a swarm in medieval times, but during the 18th and 19th century, they had actually drained out the region. But during 1914, King Albert and the artillery did its work to destroy the drainage system, causing mass flooding and in 1917, it was the year of rain as well. It was time for Curry to prepare the Canadians yet again. 
Engineers had built plank rows and duck boards and maybe wooden ladder rows so the men would not get stuck in the mud. And also, his men would also rehearse the attack and decentralized command to allow small flanking teams. And then they would use the same plans that made Vimirij a success. But artillery was a problem. Some were destroyed from the artillery from the Germans, but most of them were buried in the sea of mud. And the British did not give the artillery promise to Curry. So Curry went to high command and used a few F bombs and Haig submitting and gave him the guns. Here we meet Karl Wimmenwafa again. The Germans saw what the Allies were up to, so here we have to meet Karl again as he has to deliver a message for reinforcements of the Germans that are defending Passchendaele. He says, Die Ungern die Fahr von Mussen Fuhr, Fallen und Meigen Fagen. Eich bin schlonen schlonen munt meinen Schlahelm und Zwegens. Eich wussten, dass ich es tun müssen Wahanda. Ich mich und war dunste geflaten slaschen, öster sagen, wuf bene tinat. Mont gucken, buf und flagen, mit so red dies nützte, die inch duna dash unla geben musste. The company leader's eyes fall on me. I am ready with my steel helmet. Quickly, I knew I had to go and prepare for a dangerous errand. My mind already traced the steps I must pass through the suffering. Um, it's always the same. A life and death lottery. Karl Winnenwafe. Curry's plan this time around was to attack in a step formation similar to Vimy Ridge, but a much tighter and reinforcements would come up more quicker. He wanted a two prong attack, one to go north and the other one to go south, straight up the Passchendaele Ridge. The first attack would happen on the 26th of October, but the Canadians knew they were walking into a German trap. 5.40 am, the 26th of October. 1917. Curry gives the orders for the men to go over the top. They claw their way after their shell holes to go into the German lines. It is raining both water and shells, and if you are unlucky, blood. The only protection they had was a creeping barrage. It worked at Vimy Ridge, so the Canadians hoped it would work there as well. They slowly inched up to the German lines. Their artillery stopped as they rushed forward to the abandoned German lines. The Germans had abandoned the lines and ranged their artillery to rain down on the Canadians. Deadly accurate as well. The Germans started the counter attack and caught in the open with the 3rd Canadian Army and they took massive losses. Men with minor or major injuries were buried alive in the sea of mud, drowning in the pace of the earth, unable to move. But the Canadians held strong and they remembered what Curry had taught them to knock out the pillboxes and took the ridge and then they took Bellevue Heights. But at a cost, over 70% of the men were lost. There was a man called Captain David. He was the unit's padre. He tied a white cloth to his walking stick to help friend and foe in no man's land before they were consumed by the mud. He and other Canadians had actually rushed to help the wounded and so did a few brave Germans who actually got their wounded as well. It was a little live and let live for a brief 30 minutes a truce to get their wounded and to get back to the trenches. This happened for a while, but then some guns went off in the background as they knew it was time to go back and they nodded and went back their separate ways. As soon as it started, it ended. And soon it was back to rain, mud and blood. The Canadians had now gotten the higher ground. Curry wanted his Canadians to be in striking distance. Their successes and while on a 300 mile front, there were still 900 miles to go in striking distance. The third and final phase was about to begin. It would cost 2,000 plus casualties, Curry hoped. Lives that were not wasted just for mud. One more attack, the guns and the men were in position. It was time to strike the heart of the German defence. Passchendaele, the town itself. The Canadians had a better view and a clear objectives, but the Germans were reinforced and had better defensive positions, and their one rule, Passchendaele must be defended at all cost. The order goes out as the Canadians rush through the yellow-brown mud of the German defences. The Prairie Boys pushed their way into Passchendaele village. The urban combat was vicious. Bayonets, clubs, shovels, blunt tools, even rocks. Karl and the Germans fight as they were forced to retreat. The Winnebegas took the town, or what was left of it. Curry had his prize in Canadian hands. It was a it grim was feeling of being the only one left in your team, your company. But the Canadians did have the higher ground, and they saw green grass, the sun, even birds singing. A repeat of Vimy Ridge, and that was what they needed. Haig wasn't satisfied as Haig wanted all the Germans out of the salient which would cost another thousand plus casualties. But the real thing happened before he actually made this command. Haig had actually saw past his own ignorance and saw he could not push to the coast of 1917, so he called it off. 
Curry handed over Passchendaele to the British and the Allied soldiers said the Canadians looked like ghosts, in blood and mud. There was nothing to say that could describe the fight for Passchendaele. We hear from Calvin in Waffa one more time in 1918. He was at the German Spring Offensive but sadly, we do not know if he lived past the 1918 Spring Offensive. Sadly, Matt Fearsome and his brother did not make it out. While Matt Fearsome, the brother who wrote the diary, was in the Battle of Amiens and a shell went off next to him and he was hospitalised. Later that day, his brother did not make it and he was killed later that day. Matt Fearsome was hospitalised and then there was a huge gap in his diary for the death of his brother, but he wrote, I look back over the dark days and nights since the passing of Ross's death. I seem to be living in an entirely different world, a dreary place where nothing matters anymore. May God grant us the courage and spirit to carry on as Ross would have us do. He was sent home due to his injuries and later in life he got his teacher dream job in Toronto. At the peace talks of 1919, Haig told Curry the reasons, but Curry finally saw true after all those years and he fought for no reason, nothing more, but for mud and blood. He nodded and then he walked away from the negotiation table. Passchendaele, like the Somme, Vimiridge, Verdun, Brusilov, Garnotarno, Gallipoli, and even the Siege of Kut. It was the futile waste of life that World War I was known for. The senseless horrors on the Western, Eastern, Middle Eastern, Pacific, and even in the Balkan fronts where it all started. And that is the story of Passchendaele. And also, there was the Canadian Third Army had a 16 year old boy, you know, the boy soldiers of old. He was actually the last surviving member of Passchendaele and he died in what I believe is 2009, in the early 2000s, not before 2010. So, that is the story of Passchendaele. My last video for a while, I will still try and do other videos but yeah, yeah it's pretty good for what it is anyway I hope you enjoyed hope you learned something and I hope the redux was worth it because the redux is not really gonna change a lot so before but we end the series let's just read one more poem and this is basically the last battle of World War One for the British we may do one more but that is the infamous battle but this is the last battle we'll do and then we're going to people, planes, tanks and minorities but In Flanders fields the poppies blow Between the crosses row and row That marks our place and in the sky The larks still bravely sing and fly Scarred heads amidst the guns below We are the dead, short days ago We lived, felt dawn, saw the sunset glow Loved and we were loved and now we lie in Flanders fields. <coughs> Take up your quarrels with the foe, you have from filling hands we throw, the torch, but ask to hold it high, if we break faith we might die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Hope you learned something and take care my friends, see you Saturday maybe. Oh boy depressing episode oh well might as well leave on a banger learn something enjoy